Thank you for sharing that scripture reading, Wendy. Oh my goodness, what a powerful text. And what an amazing anthem you sang. I'm still just stirred up in my spirit from that. I, I think that an angel of the Lord came down and just stirred up this whole room as we listened to that fabulous anthem, that, that wonderful praise song from the 90s, and that great hymn, Cre All Creatures of Our God and King, put together in song. Something like that, you want to clap. I didn't, but I, I want to. Um, but my heart just sings out. We respond in lots of ways, don't we? And we want to just, just respond to what God is doing here. Not that it's a performance, but that it's something that God is doing in our hearts. And that's what we've been talking about during this season in between Advent and Lent. We've been opening ourselves up to the Spirit as we've explored texts of Scripture from the book of John where Jesus is having conversations with various people. As we've read the text of Scripture in John, we've seen many different places where Jesus has a conversation with people. And here in our text is an amazing spot for a conversation with Jesus. Jesus comes and has a conversation with a fella at a pool party. This is, this is really a, a, a fascinating thing. This is a big, huge party, we're told, in the opening of our text in chapter 5 of John. People are coming into th the Jerusalem through the Sheep Gate. Now, we know from our study of the history of the Jewish people that when they had a festival in Jerusalem, all the people in the region around would come into the city. In fact, everybody who lived within 12 miles was required to come into the city for the festival. So here comes all these people for this festival to celebrate together, and they all pass through the Sheep Gate, and right there at the Sheep Gate is the pool. And there's a little bit of debate over what the name of this pool is. The earliest texts of scripture that we have actually say the name is Beth Zeda. Beth Zeda. That's what the earliest texts of scripture are. Zeda means olive. And it's very likely that there were a lot of olive trees all around that pool right by the sheep gate. Now, somewhere along the line, very early on, texts of scripture that were duplicated began to reflect another name, and it's Bethesda, the pool of Bethesda. And the word um, esda actually means mercy. And so you can see where these names sound very familiar or very similar, and you can see why it would actually take on a different name as people copied the text in the future. Because this really is a place where people came for mercy. And it's a place where Jesus gave the Lord's mercy to people as well. Now, we're told in the text that a lot of people came who were sick, who were blind, who could not walk, or whose bodies were mangled in some way, and they were looking for some mercy. We're even told in a parenthetical statement, which isn't in the earliest documents, but we do have as a part of the tradition that remains in our text, that there was a legend that a spirit somehow descended, an angel came down and stirred up the waters there at the pool. And we have that in, in our translation that we read today. Some translations have it, some translations don't. But we have, we have definitely this sense that people are there at the pool because there's a party going on and they want some, some mercy. Now I imagine that a lot of people who are there are, are wanting to address the party goers who are coming through the gates and ask them for a handout. They want that kind of mercy from the party goers coming into town. Some people definitely wanted to be able to touch their toes into that pool and be healed. 
Who knows if they believed it or not? This is why Jesus asked the man who was an invalid from birth and said, be healed. Because he wanted to ask him what his true desires were for himself. But we know from, from the text of Scripture that Jesus does something amazing and he, and he touches them with, with his love and he touches this man who has been a crippled from birth and he allows him and enables him to walk. Now, the pool where they are and which is described in John is very symbolic in the way that John describes it. Matter of fact, Augustine, the early church scholar who is from the early 5th century and, and wrote and taught during that time, talked about how there's five porches around this pool and he says that these are very symbolic. He says they represent for John not just the fact that those porches were there, but they symbolize the five books of the law of the Torah, the five books of Moses, what we call the Pentateuch in scholarly circles, the five penta books of the law. And Augustine pointed out that people were placing their hope, their, 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 their trust in something that actually couldn't heal them, but they were just resting on the law of Moses. And the story is really indicating to us an invitation to come to the love of Jesus, which is represented by the pool. Now, if you look at the symbol of the pool here, in many different passages of Scripture, we see the symbolism of water. And in every chapter of John leading up to this point, John talks about the water being a symbol for the Spirit of God stirring. Remember, in John chapter 1, we have this description of John the baptizer who tells us that he baptizes with water, but Jesus comes to baptize with the Holy Spirit. And then in chapter 2, we have Jesus going up to a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, and there he takes the water and he changes it into wine. And then in chapter 3, we have this discussion where Jesus has a conversation with Nick at night. And Nicodemus has this desire to know, what is this about this new birth that you're talking about? And Jesus says, you have to be born of water in the Spirit. And then in chapter 4, we have who I call Sammy, the Samaritan woman at the well, and Sammy is there in the light of day coming to draw water from the well. And Jesus tells her that if you knew the kind of water I have for you, you would ask for it and it would come up within you like springs of living water bubbling up inside. And so we come to chapter 5 and we have this pool described. And Christosom, the um, other church father, very popular, John Christosom, who was... Um, a writer during Augustine's days as well, he says that this pool most definitely signifies the, the spirit stirring. And when the waters bubbled up, it was a symbol of how people might be baptized with water, but that being baptized with water is only a symbol and sign of something even deeper. It's the bubbling up of the spirit that is working in our lives. And so here in the text of Scripture, we have this sick man who is sitting by the water with this great need to be healed, and Jesus comes up and says, do you want to be healed? Now our text tells us that this man has been ill for 38 years. And once again, Augustine talks about the symbolism of this 38 years. I'm sure John, it did not escape his thinking when he wrote this down. That Hebrew people, when they were brought out of slavery in Egypt and went into the desert for 40 years, set up and, and had camp for two of those years, before they went wandering, and then before they went into the, into the promised land. And so for 38 of those 40 years in the desert, they were wandering. 
And one of the things that seems to be suggested in this text as we look at it is, are we too like this man who has been ill for 38 years or like the people of Israel who were slaves and wandering in the desert for 38 years. And Augustine suggests that the question Jesus asks to us is the same question uh, that he's asking the Hebrew people and through the prophets over and over again in the Old Testament when the prophets said, do you want to be made whole? And Jesus, like the prophet, is asking that not only of this man, but to every one of us who reads it. And the answer that the people of Israel oftentimes gave to the prophets is, well, not really. I don't really necessarily want to be whole. They oftentimes were half-hearted followers of God. And in our text today, we see this man who is healed of, a, of his body, he too is a bit half-hearted in his own faith. What does he do when he goes walking off with his mat? Some of the religious leaders see him walking, and when he's walking with his mat, they ask him, who told you you could walk with your mat? Why are you doing that? And he gives a response that's very much like Adam gave in the Old Testament. He said, that guy over there healed me and told me I could carry my mat. So just like Adam says, that woman over there gave me the fruit. He's trying to push off the blame on somebody else. I'm not taking responsibility. And then he didn't even thank Jesus when he walked away, but he just, he just didn't even know who it was. Finally, Jesus finds him. He doesn't find Jesus, but Jesus finds him and says, go and sin no more. And as a result of being warned by Jesus, what does he do? He says, oh, by the way, that guy who healed me is over there. It's not me. What a half-hearted healing. He was healed on the outside, but not on the inside. I mean, you can really tell if you compare his results of his testimony to the results of Sammy the Samaritan woman, what happened when she told people about what happened in her life. People came into relationship with God. What about Roy, the royal official? People came into relationship with God as a result. But now, here comes this half-hearted man, and people just want to kill Jesus from a result of his testimony. Well, in addition to all the symbolism that we've talked about in this text, there is the symbolism of the feast. And I think it's important to think about this feast because some scholars have talked about what feast is this because John doesn't say. Some think it could be the Passover, that's what um, John Calvin thinks. That's what Erasmus thinks. Some people think that it's the Pentecost. That's what Martin Luther thought. That's what um, Rudolf Boltmann, the great expositor, thought. But one of the things I appreciate is the scholarship of a, of a modern scholar named Dale Bruner. And what Dale Bruner says about this text of Scripture is he says that John doesn't tell us which feast it was because he doesn't want us to know. He would tell us if he really wanted us to know. And so, can you hear me? You following me here? Staying with me? Come on. Okay. So, John doesn't tell us what the feast is because he wants this feast to represent any feast. And by extension, realize that Jesus could show up at any feast in any place where we go. You follow this? Are there any feasts going on in your life today? And anybody going to a Super Bowl party? Yeah? Is, is this like a big thing? Are you getting all dressed up? Or you got some great plans? You know, who are you rooting for? You think Jesus could show up there? You know, there's, there's, there's two teams. Uh, the first one, uh, we all know about them. I mean, what number is this for them that they could win if this was, this is like, this could be win number 5,900 that they would have. And um, so, so any of you guys rooting for the Patriots today? They're cheaters. <laughs> how, 
How could a Christian even root for the Patriots? <laughs> and and I don't even I don't even know who the other team is. Um, who's the other team? Yeah, I, I really know. I used to live in New Jersey. And and New Jersey is subdivided between the North and the South. And the people in the North are New Jersey Giant fans. You know about the Giants, New Jersey Giants? Uh, New Jersey has two football teams, the Giants and the Jets. And, uh, and yet, people aren't so much into the Jets. They just, they just let the New Yorkers root for the Jets. But right on the border, we were in the north, so we rooted for the Giants. But in the south, it's the blue state above, and underneath the blue state in the south was the green state. And everybody rooted for the Philadelphia Eagles there. And so, I, you know, some people really get excited about the game. So, but some of you don't get excited about the game. Some of you get excited about the commercials, right? How many people get excited about the commercials? I am not as excited myself about the commercials this year because I heard that Budweiser is not having the Clydesdales. And I also read that they're not going to have the puppies. So without the puppies and the Clydesdales, I'm personally not so excited about the commercials. What about the halftime show? Anybody excited about the halftime show? Justin Timber Timberlake, he's kind of a twit. He's a, he's a great musician, but ever since that wardrobe malfunction back in 2004, I don't know if he's going to try to do something like that again this year. But now, if you're not into all that other stuff with the festivities of today, maybe you're into the food. So let me just... Take your imagination now and think about the food. Just imagine you go and watch a football game. You're not interested in anything else but the food. And there, the host at the football game brings out, together with the nachos and the beans and the beer, a beautiful Thanksgiving turkey. <laughs> Some people would really be impressed by the culinary matching. And just imagine that you take that turkey and you cut it and it's so brown on the outside and you put it in your mouth, that little taste of the turkey. And as you put it in your mouth, the outside is so crispy and inside it's frozen raw. <laughs> what a disappointing day. It could affect your health. It could affect your attitude about the whole day. Well, I tell you, when you read the story in the Bible today, we're left with that same kind of disappointing feeling. Because here is a man who had a conversation with Jesus. Here's a man who was healed. There's festivities all around. There ought to be people shouting for joy to God in the midst of the wonderful things that God is doing in the normal things of life. And what happens? You've got this half-baked turkey who just doesn't get it. You know, there's, there's more to life than the healings that we might receive. I have, on many occasions, visited people in the hospital room and prayed for them. And sometimes they're healed, and sometimes they're not. But does it mean that the healing of the body is the ultimate thing? I don't think so. How many of you came forward here after a service several months ago when we prayed for our dear friend Pat Gilbreth right up here. Rem remember the holiness of that day? Just reaching around her and telling her that we loved her and touching her with our hands and praying for her. You know, somebody might think, well, God didn't heal. But God does work through and through when God's love is extended to the very heart of our matter. And that's really what matters, is that God is stirring inside and out and in us and around us and between us. That's where the miracle takes place, and that's something 
that we ought to be celebrating. Amen? Amen. Let's go to God and reflect upon this text for our life and for our relationships. And then after we have a time of quiet, I'll, I'll lead us in a time of prayer. Let's pray.